for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Heidi Siegel, and I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of Temple Israel of Hollywood, and I'm so happy to be here. Thanks. Um, what a great night last night was, and I expect that the weekend is just going to keep rolling and rolling, and this is an amazing turnout, and thank you to all of you who showed up in, despite the heat um, and are enjoying our really cool lunch and everything else, and I promise you we'll make it worth your while. Um, so before we begin, I just want to I just want to give a little bit of a note of something that went on earlier today that was not a planned event um, that gave me a little insight into how smart we were to put together this panel. So I got a preview of today's show, which is, you know, Rabbi Mari Chernow is very difficult to say no to. And you realize you have to pick your moments. And I don't like to pick those moments. So for the last two, for the last week or so, she was hounding me about, I know it's a really busy weekend, but you know, there's this rally going on downtown for uh, reproductive rights. And I don't understand how we can't be there. And I'm like, because we can't be there. Because you can't be everywhere and we can't be there. Um, we were there. Um, I had the good fortune to pick up Mari and Alana and Jordana at Mari's house this morning and drive downtown with them and spend about an hour and a half at the rally where I got to see lots of other Temple Israel folks, including a ton of our ECC people. Like, that was awesome. And then come back. But the piece of the story that was really fun for me, like, the piece of the story that was super fun was just being in the car. I was not, I was no dummy. I knew what I was getting into. Was the car ride there and back. So... These three are hilarious, insightful, funny. Mari describes herself as the least funny of the three. She's probably right, but she's good. <laughs> and I just know what a treat we have today. So um, Rabbi Rick Jacobs is going to introduce the panel, but I'm going to take a moment to reintroduce um, our very special guest for this weekend, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, who all of you, I believe, many of you were there last night and got to meet and if you will just um, bear with me, I'm gonna do a little short introduction again for those of you that weren't, because you should know <laughs> how special it is that we have him with us. All right, they're totally making fun of me, and it's like very distracting. We're totally not. Um, so Rabbi Rick Jacobs is the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, the URJ, which is the most powerful force in North American life. The URJ leads the largest and most diverse Jewish movement in North America, reaching more than 1.5 million people through nearly 850 congregations, 15 overnight camps, the Reform Teen Youth Movement, NIFTI, and the Religious Action Center in DC. And for over at least nearly 150 years, the URJ has been at the forefront in promoting an open and progressive Judaism. So Rabbi Jacobs, tenure as a rabbi began in um, Westchester reform, began in Brooklyn, then in Westchester, and then he came to the URJ as our leader there. He is a tireless advocate for Israel um, that is secured, Jewish, democratic, and pluralistic. Um, he is a social justice warrior. He is a thought leader. Um, and I am so fortunate to be able to serve under him on the North American board of the URJ and can just attest to, you know, just what a truly authentic, kind, wonderful, person he is, and how fortunate we are to have him today with us. So Rabbi Jacobs, again, thank you for being here. And welcome. Thank you, Heidi. I mean, would you not come out to hear someone say so many nice things about you? Come on. <laughs> uh, by the way, I am a Californian, so I just got to get that on the table because I grew up, <clears throat> I'm going to whisper this because I don't want you to tell a lot of other people, in Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> And people who grew up in Orange County usually don't tell people they grew up in Orange County. They say, Southern California, you know. But um, I've been in New York a long time, and uh, what, a, what a privilege to be here, to be in the presence of three spectacular leaders of our people. And uh, we can't show favoritism. Eli and Arlene, you'll tell me later which is your favorite. <laughs> um, but I don't think... I should go there, um, but we are in Mari's house, so, um, but this opportunity is, um, it might feel a little bit like you're at the Chernow's uh, dinner table, uh, but it's going to be a chance for us to understand what's happening in Jewish life through the lives and the leadership of three amazing rabbis, okay? So this is going to be about everything that's going on, but 
crystallize because it's going to be in the narrative of three unique leaders. So um, there are a lot of questions. I, I told them I would just organize them. I have, you know, uh, you could use sort of the Mexican food, you know, hot, medium, and spicy, right? Uh, there's no mild. Uh, I've, got, I've got easy, less easy, and then hard. So they said, whatever you got, don't worry. Just ask the question. So the first question, first of all, you don't know who they are, but, okay, but let's, just, let's just do a tiny little ID so you can have a context and they don't have to do all that. Rabbi Mari Chernow, you know the spectacular senior rabbi of Temple Israel of Hollywood, uh, seated next to, um, the, first of all, you know there's that famous joke, it's a Yiddish Borscht Belt joke, it's about the law firm Schwartz, Schwartz and Schwartz, <laughs> and a guy calls up and says, uh, uh, can I talk to Mr. Schwartz? I'm sorry, he's out. Uh, well, then, can I talk to Mr. Schwartz? He said, I'm sorry, he's out. Well, can I talk to Mr. Schwartz speaking? <laughs> so basically, you, you got, you know, we got them all here. Um, so, but we'll identify. Uh, Jordana is uh, not only a phenomenal rabbi, but an educator par excellence, has served in Ventura, in, um, in Fairmont Temple in Cleveland, and now is Indianapolis uh, at a really wonderful congregation where she is the associate rabbi, but she's also got this passion for education, so she can't not do that. Uh, Alana Mills is a, <clears throat> a senior colleague of mine. I'm very <laughs> honored. She leads our Kalsman camp, which is up in the Seattle area. It's our Northwest camp, and she is amazing. So we heard about the 15 overnight camps spectacular camp, uh, Camp Kalsman. So you have here, you have congregational wisdom, you have a rabbi who's out leading in the broader context, you have a rabbi who's spent a lot of time in education. So we've got three unique individuals here. So the first question is, what is the question you just don't like people to ask? So, <laughs> And we're just going to get it. We're just going to like put it aside. Whatever it is that you guys are sick of hearing, because they've done this thing in in other places. This this is a phenomenal. We're taking this on the road, um, and there have been. I've, I I haven't been there, but I've heard that some of the questions are just like really. So um, this is a genuine question. You get to take it out of the list. Uh, what is the question you do not want to hear from me or anyone? Well, I'm going to dodge that for a second. <laughs> and, and, first of all, and just say uh, how incredible it is to be sitting here and seeing so many people whom I've met in sometimes recent days or weeks or months, and also some very, very dear friends who have known me my whole life. It's just, it's so special. I would also like to thank Heidi and Eric for lunch today. Thank you, thank you. And, um, and I want to congratulate you, Rabbi Jacobs, because nobody can ever tell the two of them apart. <laughs> but but you got the right one, and that's uh, yeah, that was that was well Facebook. Done. Facebook helps you. <laughs> and you know maybe if we get to it, we could tell you the funny stories about uh, public announcements have, that have been made with the wrong picture and the wrong baby Babies and all, all kinds of things. Houses. But uh, goodness, I think I think the questions that um, when we've done this before, we tell our story, which I'm happy to do, and then we try to kind of get on to like some some other b bigger picture. Stuff. Stuff. But but in the past, everybody just wants to know about our story. Like like you know, after after we've told our story, they're like, "Did you share the same bathroom?" You know, like what you know. So we'll take we'll take a few of those questions, but maybe we don't have to spend all day on that. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. I went to a friend's wedding from college, and he was literally like a mountain climber, like a mountain climber, and all of his friends were mountain climbers, like amazing. And I kept wanting to talk to them about mountain climbing, and they're like, no, talk to me about your sisters and how you're all rabbis. I'm like, no, I want to talk about mountains. So, yes, I definitely agree with that. All right, cut out the mountain climbing questions. That's 14, <laughs> 15, and 16 off. All right, go ahead. Um, so I would agree that... Um, a, it's, well, so I'm going to also wait a second to answer the question, that it's actually really nice to be here. I think um, being Mari's sister is really something special, but also seeing her in a place that embraces and honors and loves and even a few months kind of sees um, the unbelievable spiritual leader and role model and person that you are is really like, it's hard to put words as a sister of how powerful that is to see her in this community. So um, that's the first thing. 
Um, and the second thing is I, would, I was joking that we usually do get asked whether or not we shared clothes, so it's very similar. And um, we also get asked a lot about like, are you, do people have favorites between the two of you? <laughs> and I'm like, we just like each other. Like, we're just good. Great. Um, all right, so I, I'm gonna dodge the, the clothes question was like 14, 15, 16, and 17. So, uh, Sweet. But just forget the clothes, forget the clothes, forget the shared bathroom. Um, no let's, let, let's, di let's dive right in, no mountain climbers. Let's dive into the substance. But I got, I'm gonna ask it in a particular way. Um, because you are three reform rabbis. Let me just make sure to just underscore that. You each did the program at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. There are a lot of wonderful seminaries in the world. This is our reform seminary. Um, you grew up in the same home. You have the same parents, but you have chosen a different path, and how could you not? You're three different people. So could you each reflect on you know, your, your unique way in the rabbinate? You share the rabbinate with your sisters, that's obvious. But let's see if we can highlight some of the things that are unique about each of your uh, embodiment of that role not only in the choices you make, but maybe even how you show up in the work every day? Uh, it's a great question, and I think I'll, I'll start by saying that um, so, some of my path certainly has been a, a complete surprise. And like many, uh, I think more, more female, though I'm not sure, like many students at HUC, I was quite clear that I was not going into congregational work and certainly not interested in becoming a senior rabbi. That was just not, you know, like, like I was so clear about it that when our professors would start saying, here's something you might use in your congregation, I was like, I'm not listening. You know, I'm not interested, thank you very much. And then, um, and then my life took some turns and these incredible opportunities came up and I discovered that I love this work, I really love this work, um, and maybe have something to offer in this world. And so I, um, uh, it's, I will say that this career trajectory has, has taken me by surprise and, um, uh, I'll be curious to, to hear, you know, I, I, I could so much see either of you two in exactly this same, this same path, in exactly this same moment, um, and so uh, I feel so grateful that I'm here, but also know that, you know, that there were other, other things that turned you in different directions as well. Absolutely, and I will say that some of what, how we all ended in the rabbinate, so much goes to back to our parents and the house that they, um, that we grew up in and celebrating the holidays with many of you that are here uh, with us today and just that love of Judaism and that unconditional love that they gave us um, from the beginning. And I think for me, I really ended up in uh, the education world for a long time, which I really loved. I'm very, very passionate about family education and I think partly because of the house that we grew up in, no, not making religious school just a thing that the kids do, but like let's all get together as a family and let's learn together. And I think the Jewish values go so much deeper when it's a family experience and the families are bonding too. And that is where a lot of the work um, that I did um, for the first nine years of my rabbinate. And social justice is a huge thing for me as well. As I know it's shared by my sisters too, you know, as evidenced by marching this morning. Uh, so that's been a big part of my passion. Um, and now that I'm in Indianapolis, um, <laughs> that work is challenging in some new ways, uh, given the context, um, but even more important. Um, and in addition, now I'm getting into some interfaith work as well, which um, especially in a context where I live is also a really fabulous way to find other like-minded folks who also believe in the things that we believe in and want to do good in the world. Um, I think, right, so my path was also not, it's not how I, pre I did not expect myself to become a camp director. Well, that's a, not 100% true. Um, when I first worked for the UHC, when I was 21 <laughs> years old, I thought I wanted to become a camp director. And then paths took me in funny ways, and then um, I did not expect, anticipate this. And um, I happened into this through like deep relationships and a deep reminder of where my Judaism for me felt in some ways the most authentic. Um, and I was went to Camp Swig forever and, and Jordan and also went to Swig and Mari worked at Swig. Um, and it was just so uh, fundamental to my Jewish spiritual experience. And so when I was, happened into getting back into the Kalsman life through a, a good friend, 
Um, it just felt like the exact right place at the exact right time for me and that I could help make the world be a better place by making better people. Fantastic. Um, we're all aware, I believe, that this is the 50th anniversary of the ordination of Rabbi Sally Prezand, who was the first, 1972. She'll be giving the, the ordination address in Cincinnati next weekend. Uh, last weekend, Judith Plaskow gave a rather stirring and very challenging address at the New York ordination. And tomorrow, I'm pretty confident that Laura Geller will uh, stir up the, the, the discussion in a very important way. Um, but I want to just back into that question, which I'm going to pose, which is kind of like, you know, duh, of course he's going to ask this one. Um, when, I, when I began at Westchester Forum Temple in 1991, I arrived and I had a beloved colleague who I didn't know well was the associate rabbi, Rabbi Beth Singer. Yeah. Rabbi Beth Singer said to me, I don't know what you got in mind here, but let me just tell you one thing that we better not change. I think it's critical that we wear robes all the time on the bima, not just the high holidays, but uh, black robes on Shabbat, uh, the festivals, white robes on the high holidays, and that's pretty much an absolute, I don't know what else you're going to do, but don't mess with that. So I said, really? Like, <laughs> robes, it's just like, it's a thing of like another century. Right. It, it, it sort of makes us into, well, we feel like we're from another faith tradition, and it's just so off-putting. She said, let me just ask you a simple question, Rick. How often do congregants ask you about your hair or your dress or suit or shoes? I said, well, to be honest, I've never been asked a question oh. about my hair my suit, which is the same blue suit you can wear pretty much every day. And, you know, folks may say, get it cleaned occasionally. <laughs> she said, well, I got to tell you, when I arrived here, um, that was pretty much the only question I heard. I would get up there and give the most passionate sermon of my life, and I'd walk off the bima, and some nice person would say, dear, get the hair off your forehead. Just, you need to do something about that. So thinking like, did you hear? I, I just was talking for 20 minutes about some really urgent things. So, um, so when I began, I said, Beth, I will wear the robe because I get it. And if the idea was it would somehow kind of change the focus, um, that will be helpful. Well, I see a lot of head nodding here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I even think that uh, my sacred partner, Jen Kaufman, and her predecessor, Daryl Messinger, would also talk about the lay leader uh, differential. So um, we got to actually talk about this because you think that in some ways it's the 50th year, we got it all figured out, right? <laughs> but I'm just guessing that um, what I described could happen easily today, mm -hmm. here, uh, probably less so here, but it could happen in pretty much any of our communities and it does happen and it's really painful. And the question is, why aren't we further? And I just wanna quote one thing from Judith Plasco last week, who just like, this was uh, you know, just such a direct assault on the thinking that of course we should be um, beyond this. So she said, and she's probably the feminist theologian uh, of our time, her book, Standing Again at Sinai, is just, um, it's required for all of us. And in her talk last Sunday, she said, the ordination of women has led to an extraordinary outpouring of creativity in every area of Jewish life, but it has not yet transformed the power relations cemented in place over the centuries. She continues, it is entirely possible to invite women or queer people or people with disabilities or Jews of color into a system that they had little hand in creating while working hard to ensure that the system will not be fundamentally changed by their presence. If I could just summarize that in a sentence, the system is something that needs dramatic change. The role of rabbi needs to be re-envisioned, and each of you is helping to re-envision that. 
But the open question, you'll pick whichever part of it interests you, <laughs> is you are three uh, of our, you know, not just experts, but wise souls who are living in this transformational moment and know that we've come a long way, we've got a whole long way still to go. How, how do you view this 50th anniversary year as a celebration that is appropriate, but also with uh, clarity about what we still need to do? So, and we don't have to go in the same order um, whoever feels they want to jump in, but this, this has to be posed to all of you because we're all really, um, we're struggling. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, that is 100% true. That is like, I, I cannot tell you how many of those stories I've heard happen to me and happen to colleagues of mine. You know, I gave a Yom Kippur sermon and I had worked hard on it and I had practiced it and spent hours and hours and hours crafting it. And I got off the bima and someone behind my husband looks, says, Luke's, my, my husband over here, somebody say, isn't she pretty? And I'm glad they're not saying, isn't she ugly, you know, but I would much rather they comment on the text that I had really, really worked hard on and I was really proud of. So I think that happens to, to women rabbis all of the time. I also think I sit in meetings and it happens a little bit less now that I'm a little bit older, but they go, oh, pad, 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 isn't she cute? You know, I mean, this still happens. But I do think that it's great to celebrate where we are. I think having more women in senior leadership positions and congregations and in the movements, I think the more women are in these powerful positions, hopefully it's going to change. And, and I think also just talking about some of these issues, you know, and raising awareness and knowing it's not just me isolated in my experience, but it, this is things that all so many women have faced. So what power and strength can we gain from one another? What can we do to educate each other and support each other as we make these changes as a movement? Yeah, so I also, right, I was, I was on a congregation for... I should tell my story. <laughs> so I was on congregation for a couple years, and I told uh, Rick this story last night. One time I was pregnant. Well, I was pregnant three times, but one time I was pregnant while I was <laughs> in a congregational rabbit, and um, I came off the bima, and someone says, ugh. And we didn't know what we were having until they each came out, and the, someone turns to me and goes, Rabbi, we know you're having a girl because your tushy is so much bigger than it used to be. And I was like, wow, I'm never turning around for the bar who again. <laughs> um, so it is just the reality of, of and I got to thank you. Um, so that is, I think, just reality. And I, I, and I do think there is power in naming it and talking about it and saying it. I think that is real power. And I would also say, um, so my predecessor in my position was a large, six foot three, large, I don't know how else to describe. Like Man. he's like he's a big, tall, big, guy, big, big voice, presence, big, big voice kind of guy, um, and I am not six three, and I have a very different presence than he has, and um, I think one of the most powerful things is I'm not trying to be him, and the more I am myself, and the more I just enter every room as a camp director, as a rabbi, as who I am, the more I'm saying, okay, this is what a rabbi looks like, this is what a camp director looks like, this is what leadership looks like. It doesn't have to look, and by the way, like this six three foot three man um, is one of my closest friends and we've been good friends for over 20 years and we love each other, we talk to each other a couple times a week. Um, but I just try to be me and not apologize for it. And I think that helps change the movement. Uh, I'll just add a couple things. Um, first of all, it, this was really clear in Phoenix, more so, um, although it applies here, that I, I just feel so, uh, in my work, I feel completely accepted and validated and integrated, and I credit 100% of that to the female rabbis who came before me, and so one of whom is sitting right here. So I want to acknowledge that uh, you know all of the rabbis who were ahead of me really, truly paved the way and fought some struggles that I did not have to fight, and, I, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, the other thing I want to say is that when I... Uh, the one place in Arizona when I really did notice uh, a discrepancy was when I became senior rabbi, not within Temple High. There were moments like both of those guys have had, for sure, but um, in the larger Jewish community that um, uh, I, I, I was the senior rabbi of the largest synagogue in Arizona. And without naming individuals, I'll say that, you know, folks from major organizations, nobody called me. 
Nobody, nobody wanted my opinion on things. Nobody wanted to sort of invite me to the table to have the bigger conversations about the larger city and big fundraising and trends and that kind of thing. And that was notable, and they were for sure calling my male colleagues, for sure. Though one thing that complicates it is a variation of Ilana's point, which is those of you who know me uh, well now know that I'm not inclined to fight for a seat at the table. I'm not inclined to push myself there. So, so I have to, a little bit of that is on me, right? And a little bit of that is also on rising to a certain kind of leadership and um, w pushing myself to take my place in certain, you know, in certain contexts that I normally ne wouldn't necessarily. And I really don't know how much we might attribute that to generalized differences in gender. Um, but I think that is symbolic of the systematic change that we need to think about. Beautiful, beautiful and powerful and challenging. And the work that obviously we need to do with you is to think about all the structures and the way that even the role has been created. You know, you think of uh, your predecessor at Kalsman. Um, our camps were largely led until very recently by men. Right. And I was at a all staff retreat probably about seven years ago and one of the first women to lead one of our camps. And these are, these are large, very, very demanding positions. She sat me down, we had a chance to do one-on-one. -on -one. She sat me down, she said, okay, Rick, can you do math? Let me help you with the math. <laughs> 15 overnight camps, one woman, okay? I'm not intimidated, but that's just, as we say in Judaism, that ain't right, that ain't right. If we today gather all of our directors, it's a completely different uh, cadre of leaders, and they're leading differently, and I'm not gonna judge you know, good versus bad, but those differences not only are noticed, but they signal something really profound that's happening in our congregations because of a different ethos around leadership. So let's talk about camp for a minute. Um, I think all four of us went to the same camp, so let's just do like a little poll here. If you were really shaped by years at Camp Swig, uh, and you're on the panel here, please put your hand in the air. <laughs> there you, please, yeah, the, yeah. Camp Saratoga before, uh, by the way, Camp Newman is part of that trajectory. We think of them as the three uh, California camps. My question is about the place of camp in everything, right? Because camp obviously shaped, it shaped who I am. Um, I know it's had a very significant impact on who each of you are as leaders, um, but I want to ask it in an unfair way. <laughs> I'm super biased. Uh, and I am, <laughs> so and I, and we all are, but I'm gonna ask it in the following unfair way. You, all three grew up in a spectacular Jewish home. Eli and Arlene, are you listening? A spectacular Jewish home where it wasn't, you know, for the kinder, uh, it was for everybody. And you lived it, you experienced it, it was joyful, it was meaningful, A. B, you also went to synagogue, you went to Hebrew school, you did all those things, and on top of that, you went to camp. Now, one of the things that we know now about Jewish life is that right now, it's very likely that someone has one of those three, if they have any of those three, but it's rare that they have two of those three, and it's almost impossible to find people who had all three. So here's the impossible question, which of course you will either choose to ignore or potentially answer, it's Great. all up to you. Which of those three experiences do you think had the most impact on you as Jewish people and, and now into your ravenous? Because I think it's the demographic debate we have every day about where to put resources, where we can make transformation, and particularly when we have many young people who have none of those three, which are the ones that will actually have the greatest impact? So I'm not asking it to, first of all, to put your parents in an awkward position, <laughs> because let's just say, what a gift, what a gift to grow up in that home. But I really, there's a purpose to this question, because I think we, we have to get inside of it. I'll just give you one more tee up. We did a study of our alumni were you going to go there, Alana? No, you're good. I'll, I'll reinforce it. So the study, we actually <laughs> we commissioned one of the, um, really one of the most uh, accomplished researchers in sort of Jewish educational um, settings 
to study the alumni of our camps and found that more than Hebrew school, more than um, just familial experiences, four out of five of those who had not maybe one summer, but a series of summers um, are now engaged deeply in Jewish life. So, you know, so that helps us in some ways, but you, you're the, the three of you are the test case because you got all three. Help us think about that question. So, so I would say my understanding from research is that um, right, immersive Jewish experiences, when you are living it, when you are surrounded by it 24 hours a day, whether it is a trip to Israel, camp, a series of retreats, like that is what truly impacts identity more like minute minutes spent there versus impact, it's clear that it's immersive Jewish experiences. Um, I would say that kind of from my own life, when I point to my Jewish identity, it is easy for me to point to camp. But um, it's also clear, it's so funny. I so I spent a lot of time listening to Jewish music and it feels like I know all of the songs. And what's amazing is when I think about it, I actually can't identify it if I learned it from my day school or I learned it for camp. And so the power of the experience we had was that we did have so many entrees into it. And we had so many things that combined created this powerful Jewish identity. And I am very aware that when, we have, when I have 200 campers in front of me, for probably 20% you know, of them, the only Jewish experience they have is the two weeks they are with me a year. And that is frightening when I think about the future of Jewish. Like, I, th I think I do a good job, but those two weeks they spend at camp is not the entirety of Judaism. Those two weeks they spend at camp does not, it creates a Jewish identity, but it doesn't create a Jewish identity in a silo by itself. So I think it's easy to point to it, but it can't be the only thing that Jews experience in their life. So, so Rick, I'm gonna combine your question. Um, and really what I think is going forward, I think what is really fantastic is to kind of combine them. I'm lucky for where I'm located with my current job is that we're about 20 minutes from Gucci, which is one of the other URJ camps. Um, and we actually go to Gucci. It's, it's not tied to the Oh, yeah, the not to the brand. Just help Believe them out me, there. It is yeah. not that nice. <laughs> Don't get any misillusions about that in your minds at all. Um, but we actually spend Rosh Hashanah at, at this camp. We do services out there. We're in our jeans. We have food out there. Then we have um, learning sessions for the rest of the day, and some are kid-focused, and some are family-focused, and some are adult-focused, and we end with Havdalah. And it was the best, high, best Rosh Hashanah I have ever had. Um, just, it was so fantastic to be out there. And there's something special and different that happens at camp. And it was, so the openness of the bonding that people had um, and Rosh Hashanah was incredibly powerful. And what I'm working towards in the next year is to do more retreats, to use camp on a regular basis. So instead of making camp one thing and temple one thing, I really want to combine them. So I hope that other places were able to emulate and do that, think that and do other things like that. Because I think then it is reinforced and then it can be really powerful. Uh, I, I would just add that it's a variation of what Ilana said, but um, I think part of the power of those experiences is living in Jewish time, being in Jewish spaces and living in Jewish time. And having been at a synagogue for 18 years, which is so extraordinary, and coming here, which is so extraordinary, and one of the things we have here is a day school. I, I think that the power of having hundreds of kids on our campus every single day who know when Purim's coming, it actually affects the whole synagogue. It, it, it really, you know, it really has an impact on the way we think and the depth which we challenge ourselves to go to and the, um, you know, the families who are here. And so I think that it's a, it's a giant challenge because day school is not realistic or the right choice for every family. Camp is challenging for many families. And so how we, how we create that immersive experience, that sense of Jewish time, that being, being really deep inside it, um, I think that's, that's one of our challenges is how we broaden that possibility for people. Thank you. That was perfect because to take the idea of what camp is, it's an immersive experience. We need immersion. We cannot get this just to come into our, our minds and it's going to embody kind of all of our days. Um, one of the things we also see a lot of in Jewish education, again, not just for, for Giordano, but to think about 
how camp has affected how we do Jewish education in congregations, right? The informal, I mean, the song leading, the, you know, the more active. Because when you're at camp, the Jewish learning, right. it's like, you know, it just, they slide it in there. You don't even realize, oh my God, we just did an hour of Jewish learning. It was like so much fun. It wasn't quite like I remember Hebrew school. In fact, my mom signed me up for, he, for uh, Camp Swig without my knowing it. And she announced at dinner one night, you're going to go to Jewish camp this summer. I said, the hell I am. I, don't, I could imagine like they were going to bring the organ from my Reformed Synagogue in Orange County and we were going to sit in classrooms and like sit with a chalkboard and the teacher yelling at me to be quiet. And I thought, you think I'm doing that in the summer? She said, I heard it's different. I said, yeah, right. And of course, my mom was right. She was always right. Um, but the truth is, the experience of what actually is joyful in those immersive settings, whether it's the Rosh Hashanah at camp, whether it's a day school that creates this kind of communal experience, how we do education has thankfully been affected by the success of the camp experience, which I have to believe is already finding its way into all the things you do. But I want to pivot, because I'm, I'm keeping my eye on the, you know, this, the, the clock here. Camp is also, for us as a movement, the place where diversity oh. has been most impactful. Yeah. Uh, let, me just, let me just give it a frame. The frame is in 2015, the reform movement, the URJ, with our 850 congregations and our overnight camps and our NIFTI and all of it, our Religious Action Center in Washington, D.C., passed the most comprehensive trans rights resolution in Jewish life in 2015. And can I just say, we did it unanimously. Jews don't do anything unanimously. <laughs> if we say, what do you want for lunch? You know, people say, well, I want salad. No, I'd like to have pasta. No, a little pizza. So 5,000 delegates unanimously affirmed that. But I can tell you, it didn't happen because of what that moment was. It happened at camp, yeah. where we previously, to that moment, brought the first trans camper uh, in, in Eisner camp. It was an 11-year-old who had come to camp for a few years as Jonah. This is, this is the family story that they've told publicly, so I'm not in any way um, overstepping, though I have been known to do that. Um, and the question was, the family asked, will Jonah come back to camp this summer as Hannah, and will it be safe? Will it be successful? And the camp, led by Lewis Boardman, said, we're going to make it successful. We're going to do an entire education with our community, with our staff, with our parents. Because you can't have one trans camper at camp without the whole team being on board. Because all you need is like one person you know, in the dining hall does that horrific thing. And it's just it's excruciating. So I just want to like raise the question of the diversity of our movement, which you know sometimes we're doing okay. In a few cases we do well. In a number of cases we're not doing well at all. Talk about you know um, the way diversity is part of the everything we do, whether it's in congregations, in learning settings, in day schools. We have we have a lot of you've probably gotten this question from a family. Say, will my daughter be the only? Jew of color nope. at camp this summer, because honestly, it's just too much to ask her to go and be the only Jew of color. So I want to ask about the diversity, but I think it's everywhere that we're working on this, and how are we going to actually get our full sense of we and, and really you know, make that not something we, we tell everybody or we pass a resolution, but it's real, because that's how our communities are structured. So um, who wants to jump in on that? Well, I can talk about camp. <laughs> that is a good. So, um, we, I am really proud, especially of the, our transgender campers. We have a ton of them. And um, we actually actively built our cabins in a way that there is a space that campers can change if they're not comfortable changing in front of others because they're not comfortable in changing in others or because they are in a cabin that is not the same cabin of the gender they were assigned at birth. Um, and we just have built a culture at Kalsman that that is what we do. We just, everyone is seen for who they are and honored for who they are. And, um, you know, every summer, 
campers tell us that they feel like they are able to kind of shed the skin and shed the masks and, and shed the things they have to put on every day and they can be their true selves at camp and they are honored at camp. And we have a lot of um, campers who, this is the first time they tell people that they might feel that they are not the gender that they are assigned at birth. Uh, last summer we happened that three of them happened at camp and they all named themselves Max. I don't know, so, it was the name. Max. And so people would be like, someone called Max their dead name. I was like, I don't know which Max you're talking about. But it was just the name, apparently. Um, and, I, and I'm really proud of it. And we have, we have a, not as many as I want, um, but we have some Jews of color. I would love more, I'm, right? But I, I have to say, I, am, I recognize um, that it, I'm gonna wait for the traffic to go for a second. Hollywood. It's, it's biker Shabbat down the I know. road. So like, you know, just. Um, I also recognize that I am so lucky to be a camp director because I really get to form a world. And I, um, right from, and I start thinking about the world the minute the campers leave one summer, I'm already thinking about what kind of world I want to create for the next summer, right? So it starts with how I talk to my how my assistant directors and I talk, to our leadership team, to our staff, to our campers. And we have this closed world that I, we get to live in for between seven and 21 days. And I, it's like a little bit like Disneyland, right? Like I pick what the signs look like. I pick what their day experiences look like. I pick their lessons. I pick all of these things. So it is so easy. And I am privileged that I get to create this world that is welcoming. And if you're not welcoming, like if you're not going to be open and inclusive, then that's like, that's what our community values. Um, but I think it is much harder outside of the camp world to do that. Um, so I think what my sisters are trying to do is actually more challenging, because I just get to say, like, okay, this is the world I'm creating, and this is who we do, what we do. do you want to so, I'll just say, um, you know, I think that uh, as a congregational rabbi, um, th there's an impulse to want to work on this by, you know, and, and certainly in Arizona more so than here, you know, like we got to find some black Jews, you know, somebody find, you know, some, somebody find me some people of color. And that's really, um, I, I haven't been successful at that. And I don't, I don't think that's the, a great way to do it. So I think that, um, it's, there are a lot of different strategies about leadership and openness and the messages and maybe the language we produce our materials in and all kinds of things. I do think one strategy might be um, to think about, well, let me, let me preface this first. Uh, you told a story last night about walking into a um, synagogue and you being, uh, it, the assumption being that you were a Jew and the person of color next to you that that person was not a Jew. So I, I, I wanna be very careful about that and be really clear that I am not making that assumption. However, I think one path to opening up in terms of diversity will also have to do with welcoming interfaith families in a deeper way um, because I think that the, you know, the more people who are diverse feel comfortable and feel like this is their home, the better conversations we're gonna have about it and the better ways we're gonna be able to be really serious about, um, about inclusion. And I'll share very different, you know, remember I'm in Ohio, I was in Ohio, now I'm in Indiana, <laughs> so that is important for this context. Uh, it is not a very diverse in Indiana at all. Um, I wish it was, I, I really do on a lot of levels. Um, but I will share that one thing that we struggle with is political diversity, um, that we have a mixed congregation. You know, I'll share, I gave a sermon last week about abortion, which literally three people got up and walked out when I was, <laughs> Only three, that's good, I suppose. Um, but I was talking about the importance of a woman's right to choose, and again, these three people, two board members walked out. And um, no, uh, two men and one woman. One was a married couple. Um, and I received a four-page ne note from someone else in the congregation, single-spaced, about how much they hated my sermon um, and all these terrible theories and whatnot. Um, but the, the vast rest of the congregation was incredibly supportive and lovely and so glad and I got thanked and many people got in touch with the, the leadership to thank me because they knew I was gonna get some flack for it. Um, and that was very appreciated. Um, but it is definitely challenging uh, to create an accepting space when some of the views that people hold um, are exclusionary to others. 
And, you know, very specifically in my previous role, a family called me because they were worried that their child wouldn't feel safe in our religious school um, because they believe marriage should be between a man and a woman. And so how do I create a safe space for that child when we did have, you know, children who were gay and children who were being raised by, you know, two men or two women? And um, how do we create? I, I definitely wanted to talk to the first family and be like, can we talk about where this opinion comes from and why? <laughs> you know? But how do we create a safe space? Um, it's very challenging. Um, and I, I, I don't have good answers to that yet. So the last category is the reality that we know now with all of the demographic surveys. And by the way, the Jews, if we were like half as good at reading our sacred texts as we are demographic surveys, we'd be fine. <laughs> like, I, I mean, we spend like an entire year on the Pew survey, like the Talmud, like, oh yeah, that Talmud. So, um, so every one of the demographic surveys tells us that there are more Jews outside the walls of everything, outside the walls of synagogues, federations, day schools, camps, than are inside, okay? So that could lead us to a really foolish public strategy, which is let's just stay comfy with all the nice people who are with us right now. Let's just feel good. The majority of our people are not currently engaged. So I think the big question for Jewish life is what do we do about that? And when we talk about you know, some of the changes in terms of how people choose to connect or not, it's about a, an entirely different, not just mindset, but a different way of thinking about our priorities and the bridges that go outside and kind of bring together. And the, even the conversation about diversity is not something that's rooted only in the concepts of you know, uh, racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's also about that would give us actually our full strength. So part of the diversity, and I just want to really celebrate Arlene's work, uh, who for decades, for decades, <laughs> Rabbi Alexander Schindler, you know, gave this beautiful, powerful, you know, we're going to be inclusive or interfaith families. And then, like, there had to be people on staff, like, who's going to actually figure out how to do that? <laughs> well, Arlene is one of those people who figured out how to do that. And it's helped so many couples, so many families, into Jewish life, and that is a big piece of the new reality of why people are outside the walls, because many, many people just don't feel like this is their place, that they belong. Um, and there is a lot, the, the interfaith component of the outside the walls is as large as the inside. It's the largest group of Jews on the planet. Did you hear that? Interfaith outreach isn't something, you know, because they're like four people at the Oneg, you know, oh, let's go. It's, it's the majority of us, and I can't find one Jewish family who doesn't have one very important person or many important people who are not Jewish, who are part of the core of that family. So this is something, God bless you, Arlene, because you've been teaching and planting seeds, and the garden is growing. Um, and the conservative movement, let me just say, one of the reasons it's struggling the most, they haven't figured out how interfaith families really feel like they belong, right? And it's, it's, it's a whole thing. So the question, I know, ask a question, Rick. That was a sermon. Don't ask. <laughs> question is, what can we do to change the reality of more people being disconnected than connected? And what are some of the strategies that you're, you know, experimenting with, seeing successful or things that you tried and that didn't work? Like, you know, you share sort of like the, that didn't work. But this is our challenge. If we don't get this into a much more effective communal set of uh, practices, that's a very dangerous notion for our viability. But the good news in that, if we can learn how to do that right and well, it's transformational. But... It's, it's not happening yet the way it needs to, so please. Uh, it's a great question. It's a huge question. It's something we think about all the time, and there are lots of uh, ways to think about it. And uh, what I'm about to say has been said a million times. This isn't new, um, but um, 
what we need actually is for, for you to raise about $100 billion for the country. Would, would you do that for us? Wait, wait, did, you, you did, <laughs> I, did Jen, did, did you get that on the to-do list without um, that? And, yeah, great, billion. thank you, I appreciate okay. that. But, um, you know, one of the barriers, certainly for young people and for people who do not feel a natural inclination to join is that it's expensive, and we all know that it's expensive. And obviously I'm teasing, and I know there's a big impulse for, you know, rabbis in the field to say, well, why isn't the URJ, uh, you know, so I'm just kidding about that. Let me be clear about that. Um, Thank but you. You're welcome. Um, but I think it's I think it's on all of us. It's been said to think about creative funding models. I do believe that people who have been touched by their own Jewish life might really want to give some money to making sure that future generations are touched by their Jewish life. And many of those people can also understand it's going to have to look different. It's gonna have to look not, you know, like come spend Shabbos with us, which I love, don't get me wrong, but, but it's gonna have to look different. So I think that one small little piece of the strategy is to think about um, financially building for the fu Jewish future that we're excited about. I do also think some of it is just creative programming. You know, we all had to pivot dramatically um, because of COVID. And so many people who were interested in converting to Judaism or have young families could Zoom. You know, you don't have to, you know, get your kids in the car. Or, you know, if you're new to Judaism, it can be intimidating to walk into a uh, synagogue. So being able to Zoom and get, you know, pieces of it first definitely helped lower the barrier. So I think it's, what else can we do? What else is creative? Social justice, despite what I said about living in the Midwest. Uh, so social justice is a huge engagement uh, strategy that has been very successful all over the country. Creative programming, like the ones I'm talking about at camp, you know, I think it's just, and getting literally out of the synagogue. Even if it's just a coffee date, I think the more we can do that is not as place-centered, that is more just out um, in the community is also a great way to welcome people who might not walk through the doors but want the connection. And so thinking about what we can do to help make that happen. All right, so this is actually what keeps me up at night is, um, right, thinking about, like, what, where, where are my new campers going to come from? Um, and I, I think... I think Judaism has so much to help people create a meaningful life. And so how we show that meaningful life is so important. Um, and, I, and I do think it is in going to marches and it is in immersive experiences and it is thinking outside the box. And I, Mari is totally right that like, it is in not, in being able to afford it. Um, I think that's a big deal. And, um, and I think it is also figuring out how to empower people who love it to express what there is to love. And I know, um, as far as I know, every Jewish organization has amazing lofty goals and there are never enough staff members to do all of those lofty goals. And so what are those partnerships also that we can have with our community to help us, um, like Trina was saying, like, look outside the box, think outside the box, but also show the magic that we have. So I'm looking over at my, um, my colleagues, Rabbi John Rosoff, who I know is no stranger to anyone. And next to him is Yaron Shavit, who, if you were here last night, you know that he is not only currently the deputy chair of the Jewish Agency for Israel, but prior to that was the head of the reform um, movement in Israel. Uh, one of the great teachers of this is someone who is now for the year, spending the year in Sacramento, California, Galit um, uh, Kohn Kedem, who is a magician. She built a congregation where there was no building, no Jew, with well, there plenty of Jews, no Jews who were members, no books, no computers, no anything, and she just built it out of sheer relationship. And it's vibrant, it is an amazing place. We had her present, uh, Jen invited her to present to our North American board to tell what could be, okay? So um, we've got the last question, which has to be one of these like, you know, big, hopeful, I, I don't know about you, but just listening to these three rabbis, I, f I feel great. I feel great about our, f our present, and I feel really hopeful about our future, because it, it is about everyone together, and that's also a style of leadership that is transformational. And don't miss that we've got practitioners of that better way to lead. 
But I want to close with each of you a dream and a hope for, for the Jewish lives that we're all not only living but leading. And uh, you could pull a text that you love, but just something that just for you is kind of how you don't just stay up at night worrying, but how you get up in the morning ready to do the holy work. So, um, and we're going to have Mari go last just because we're in her house. Um, so, um, Here first. there we go. <laughs> Apparently, I, I, I've been nominated <laughs> to go first. Um, I really think there is so much hope in the future, for sure. You know, we listen, we were here last night, we were hearing the kids sing, or, you know, every time I do a wedding, or I, I'm on a bait din, or do a tour study. I mean, there's so much hope, there's so much good that we do um, in Judaism. And like Alana said, I just hope people, I hope we have this opportunity just to let it shine even more and make people even more proud and excited and want to be a part of it. Um, so I will quote a text as, <laughs> if you spend a few minutes with me, I often quote uh, the daughters of, of Zalafafad. They're my favorite, favorite story in the entire Torah. Um, I know many of you know it, but just a very, very quick um, summary of it. Um, at the time, you know, it was at the end of Numbers, and at the time, uh, property was passed from male to male, father to son. Um, and this man dies, and he has a no son. So his five daughters, his, these five sisters, um, go to speak to the elders and to Moses and to the most powerful people in society. And I, I find that so incredible that they have the strength and the courage to do this. Okay, I'm talking really quick. Um, and the law gets changed um, because of them. So I think it's also about more people claiming their space and being proud of it um, and making Judaism their own. Uh, not surprising, I think mine's similar. I will also talk quickly, but, elo oh, but enunciate. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I wish every person felt about Judaism the way our campers feel when they leave, um, of ownership, of feeling it in your insides, like without even knowing the words. Um, and that's my dream. And, you know, I think Jordana was saying she wants to expand her relationship to camp. And at Kelsman, I'm working to expand Kelsman in terms of our relationship to the Jewish community. Um, but I want like every, that's what I want every Jew to feel is how our campers leave. And uh, for me, it's actually the image of Moses when he is too, uh, whole, he's too tired to hold up his arms and um, the community holds up his arms for him. And it's also this idea like, no one person's gonna do it alone. The way we're gonna do it is if we do it together. I don't think I have a text for this one, but, I'll, but I will say that um, I am completely convinced, the reason I am not pessimistic, I'm very optimistic about our future and whatever it is that we create, is that I am completely com convinced that everybody, everybody has a spiritual life of every age, of every walk of life, and so on. We use different language for it, but, but everybody can talk about things like hope and despair and joy and heartbreak and all of the things that I think make up a spiritual life. So, so my dream and what I wake up every morning trying to think about is how do we make sure nobody is lonely in their spiritual life? I want us to be together, whether we're at the march this morning, whether we're running a camp, whether we're dealing with a personal heartbreak or celebrating a milestone, I want, I want everybody to have company on that journey. Amen, amen, amen. So on a weekend of installation, uh, it's also a time to generate ideas and hope to see with clarity what is, not just what we want it to be, and then to figure out who are the people who are in our kind of speed dial um, or in our text group. And uh, the Sisterhood of Israel is alive and well. <laughs> and if one has an idea, you can be sure the other is going to hear about it. And if one has a question, you can be sure that there's going to be some sharing of different approaches. But I, I know you'll join me in feeling incredibly excited about not only the tenure of Rabbi Mari Chernow here at Temple Israel, but also of the leadership of these remarkable rabbis and a new generation that is not going to do what was done because that was then. This is now. And the demands and the opportunities are literally before us. And I've got such confidence that the three of you are going to be leading us in that way that you do, which is not to get out in front and look around and say, well, where is everybody? No one's here with me. But to bring us all with, with you on this journey. So God bless you. Shabbat shalom. Yay.
Let's please thank the president of our movement for leading this morning.